Hi everyone, welcome to the Virtual Voyage General Aviation Summit 2022. My name is Sophie O'Sullivan and I head up the General Aviation and Remotely Piloted Aircraft Systems Unit here at the Civil Aviation Authority. Today's actually our third Virtual Voyage event. We've run two in the past, which we've had as live events, and we were able to reach 5,000 of the GA community, which we've been absolutely delighted about. We're going to do today as a playback video so that you can use this recording and share it with any contacts you've got in the GA community so we can reach as many of you as possible. The last two events were very much aimed at GA pilots and what we wanted to do today to make sure that we reach all aspects of our community was actually put on a slightly different programme and we're going to have content today that's really aimed at those of you that work in the airworthiness part of GA. So maybe you're a pilot that maintains your own aircraft, maybe you work in a maintenance organisation, we've put together a programme that we really hope you find of use today. The idea for this very much came from a programme that we're running as part of our GA Change programme this year, which is to create another version of the Skyway code, but for airworthiness, which we're calling the airworthiness code. You gave us feedback in the consultation that we ran in November 2020, when we asked you what would you like to see in the GA Change programme, and you said to us, actually the Skyway code works really well, it's very accessible, you should have another document that covers airworthiness aspects. So that's what we're doing and we're planning on launching that shortly. And that's where the idea for the virtual voyage today really came from. So for the first session, I'm gonna hand over to Neil Shepherd, who's one of our airworthiness surveyors, and he's gonna to talk to you about the airworthiness code and what to expect. Over to you, Neil. Thanks, Sophie. Um, my name's Neil Shepherd. I'm a surveyor within the General Aviation Unit and airworthiness surveyor. Um, and I'm here to talk to you today about the airworthiness code and maintenance guide for light aircraft. A code specifically for uh, to explain some of the issues around aircraft maintenance and airworthiness management. They are complex issues and our ambition for the new guide is that it explains those subjects in, in plain English and is ultimately more accessible for our GA community um, than the existing regulations. We've primarily aimed at pilots, owners and operators, which includes ATOs and DTOs, so your training organisations, and it should also be really useful for maintenance and continuing airworthiness management organisations involved in GA, and that's our target audience. With the introduction of Part M Lite in particular, there have been a number of changes in the airworthiness regulations, and it's important that these are shared. We also are fully aware that most people want to do the right thing and we appreciate the responsibility that we have in the CAA to help the community understand those regulations and what is expected, ultimately benefiting safety. We know from positive feedback received that the format of the Skyway code works, so we thought we'd try and produce a similar document for maintenance and continuing airworthiness. Part ML or Part M Light details the continuing airworthiness requirements for certain GA aircraft. And when we talk about continuing airworthiness, in plain English, what we're talking about is maintenance and technical management of the aircraft. For example, making sure that it has a maintenance program, that that program's regularly reviewed and the aircraft is maintained in accordance with it. Defects are properly corrected or deferred. Airworthiness directives are properly complied with and repairs and modifications are properly embodied. There are other items in this list, but we can think of them as the processes required to maintain the aircraft in an airworthy condition. Part KO is replacing the CAMO and the maintenance approvals and combining them into a single approval designed specifically for GA. So these are for approved organisations and no longer uses the regulation that was originally designed for larger, more complex aircraft and operations. A lot of the responsibilities that used to lie with the CIA are now through these new regulations delegated to approved organisations and owners and operators. So it's really important that these responsibilities are properly understood, accepting that not everyone wants to wade through legal text, hence this new document. Together, you can think of part ML and part KO as new and proportionate framework for continuing airworthiness, which corresponds to the lower overall risk posed by light aircraft. We're planning for the new document to be available over the next few months. You'll be able to download it from the CIA website and once completed we'll share a notification via our Skywise system to let you know that it's there um, and you'll also be able to buy a, a hard copy which will be available much the same way as the uh, current Skyway code is. We intend it to be a living document. We want feedback um, if there's information that you would think 
um, you, you think we would benefit from being in there, then by all means, feedback to us. If you've got comment on the content, again, feedback to us. And you can do that directly to the GAU uh, by using our email address, which is ga at caa.co.uk. Thanks for the update, Neil. As covered, the Airworthiness Guide, a maintenance guide for light aircraft, will be updated very soon. We hope you find that of use. And as always, we would love to hear your feedback on the document and how much you're using it. Please look out for a Skywise, because that's how we'll let you know when that document is about to be published and we'll update the GA web pages from the CAA. So we're now joined by David Street. David's going to talk to us about another of our Airworthiness projects. Thank you for joining us, David, and over to you. Hi, my name is David Street. I'm an Airworthiness Surveyor for General Aviation uh, in the UK Civil Aviation Authority. As part of my role as an Airworthiness Surveyor for General Aviation, I travel the country looking at aircraft. Uh, right across the spectrum of general aviation, from balloons to gliders, um, to flying school aircraft, to Spitfires. The Camo Roadshow started off as an idea of a workshop around the country to explain and, and, and help and guide industry into understanding what the responsibilities of a Camo. But it quickly became clear that we had a lot more work to do. Adding in the regulating changes, adding in Brexit, adding in uh, licensing, talking about apprenticeships was really key to to uh, engaging with industry and getting the most from both sides, so the CAA and industry gaining from the Camo Roadshows. The Camo Roadshow was a series of events that gave us uh, a chance to talk to industry about um, policy changes, about uh, how we expect uh, a continuing airworthiness organisations to work. The Roadshow started in 2019, uh, finishing uh, in April 2020. Uh, we visited 22 locations, met with um, 200 people from industry and were a fantastic opportunity to engage with these uh, with these camos. In the first Camo Roadshow in, in 2019 and 2020, we covered topics such as the responsibilities of the camo, responsibilities of the owners. We looked at Brexit. We talked about the new Part ML, uh, Part KO regulations that were coming into force and tried to give assistance and guidance towards those changes. We'd like to do more camera roadshows. Uh, we, we would like to travel around the country um, visiting locations again, but we need those locations to be um, to be honed in. So we're hoping that uh, industry can give us some ideas of where they would like us to go. We're going to be sending out a questionnaire to industry to ask for your suggestions on topics and locations that you want the camera roadshows. Thank you for the update, David. That roadshow sounds fantastic and a really good way for us to get in touch with the community, something that we're really keen to do, particularly after the pandemic, where many of these events have needed to be online. What we're actually going to do for that event is ask you what you would like to hear from us on. So as David mentioned, we're going to be doing a survey to help us capture the topics you and your organisations would like to hear about. Please look out for that on the Virtual Voyage webpage and tell us what content you would like to see. So we're now going to move on to our final update, which is on the B3 license. And to talk us through this, I'm going to welcome Joanna McDonald. She's another one of our GA team members, part of our surveyor team. So thank you to Joanna and over to you. Thanks, Sophie. Hello, my name is Joanna McDonald and I'm CAA Airworthiness Surveyor for the General Aviation Unit. My role involves auditing approved organisations that manage and maintain a variety of aircraft, surveying the aircraft themselves, and the individuals who are licensed to maintain them. I also am a licensed engineer and a subject matter expert for engineering licensing in the GAU. This means I get a real feel for the challenges present within the sector and I'm here to talk to you about one of those challenges that has been identified as a risk relating to the succession planning and diminishing number of licensed aircraft engineers in the general aviation community. Based on our observations and discussions with organisations and individuals, there are three main reasons why the number of licensed engineers continue to diminish. One is ageing profile and the demographic of licensed engineers, the inability to, to have succession planning due to the lack of new licensed engineers coming into GA, and the lack of training provision appropriate for the GA license structure. I'm going to talk through these reasons in more detail. We would then really appreciate it if you as members of the GA Airworthiness community could provide more information on these observations. To help provide more context, a sample review of active maintenance organisations allocated to one of the airworthiness surveyors within the CAA General Aviation Unit identified the following age demographic across 14 organisations 
These are maintenance only, not camo organisations. As you can see from the graph, there's a clear age majority with almost 50% of DLEs from this sample age being aged between 71 and 80 years of age. And a total of 71 being aged 65 or over. So why is this the case? Anecdotal accounts indicate that there is a lack of young people coming into the GA maintenance industry. It seems some organisations are reluctant to train due to the cost, the lack of appropriate GA relevant training, and in some cases, a concern over the retention of staff once qualified due to the significantly higher pay seen in the commercial industry. In terms of the licence itself, we have had the Part 66 B1.2 category licence for fixed wing piston engine aircraft, which is widely used in the GA community. We also have the relatively new category B3 licence, which has been created specifically for the GA community, covering piston engine aircraft weighing less than 2000 kilos. The B3 licence negates the requirement for an aircraft type course due to the relative simplicity of the aircraft within this group. It seems that there is a general lack of awareness for the new B3 licence, which we look to tackle through our project CAMO, which was a series of roadshows delivered by the GA Youth Fairs across the country. However, those that are aware of the licence state that there is no training provision in the UK for the full scope of the module tuition and the exams required for the B3 licence. Self-studying Part 66 qualifications is considered unrealistic for the experienced engineer who may have competing commitments such as family. Part 147 training organisations that provide the module training for Part 66 licences do not provide the modules required for the B3 licence. The higher level B1.2 modules can be accredited towards the licence, but some of these module courses are hard to come by. If the full list of modules for the B3 licence were available, the training would naturally be shorter than the equivalent B1.2 and the commercial B1.1 licence. Getting the buy-in from the 147 organisations would also enable the availability of a full basic course, which in turn allows for the dispensation in years of documented experience required for the, from three years to just one. This can also be said for the B1.2 licence. Elementary research has suggested that the B3 licence has not met with a response from the 147 basic training organisations, most likely due to the limited volumes and high research levels and development costs for any course and examinations. This means that delivery of the course may not be financially viable. However, there would appear to be a core of GA maintenance personnel that have been working in the GA sector for many years and therefore have a high level of experience but lack the engineering license. These mechanic level staff are generally well settled into their roles and perhaps less likely to migrate to larger commercial industry. The B3 license is also less convertible to the B1.1 license, often sought by commercial organisations. There are clear risks associated with the issues I've outlined above. If no action is taken, these risks could include normalising multiple organisations being covered by a single licensed engineer, leading to work being signed off routinely without either being properly supervised or inspected. Sickness or mobility issues associated with either age or health. This can prevent proper inspection leading to maintenance errors or routine inspection findings being missed with subsequent release to services of an airworthy aircraft. Reduction in maintenance capacity in GA leading to non-compliant behavior driven by both the lack of maintenance availability and the potential increasing cost to those organizations that remain. And lastly, a lack of maintenance provision holding back the community growth. If we look to address the issues highlighted, we can see fundamental improvements in the following areas. Positive and real impact on safety, set foundations for the future prosperity of GA in the UK, assisting in the re-energising of the next generation of GA maintenance engineers. And lastly, enabling growth and more choice in GA maintenance. To help with this, we have devised a short survey we would like to specifically aim this at maintenance organisations, engineers, mechanics, and anyone who has any feedback on engineering licensing. The information shared in this survey will be used to better understand if there is a role for the CAA to better support GA maintenance organisations. We really appreciate your input. Thank you.
Thank you very much for that, Joanna. And just to echo that message, please do fill out the survey so that we can understand your feedback and improve these going forward. So now we're going to turn to an animation where we're asking about carbon monoxide and any experiences you may have had where actually you think a carbon monoxide active detector might have really helped you. This is all part of the series that we've addressed before in Virtual Voyage, but really we're asking for your feedback about experiences you've had, maybe mistakes that you've made. All of this is content and data that helps us shape policy and understand any safety concerns within the GEO community. Have you ever had a flying experience you wished you had shared earlier? Do you learn from others in the flying community and talk about your experiences to help everyone else to stay safe? It's never too late to learn from mistakes and experiences. This is a real life example of where human factors can have a positive and negative impact on flights and our capacity as pilots to properly understand and manage the situations we find ourselves in. It was like any other autumnal day, very cold and with a stiff breeze, but otherwise fine. I thought there might have been a few more launches that day, as it was possibly going to be one of the last flyable days before winter, before the airfield becomes waterlogged. I was doing something I had done many times before, providing a tow launch for gliders at my local club. I was the sole user of the aircraft that day, and had been the day before too. I had no reason to think that the aircraft was anything but serviceable, but I conducted my pre-flight checks as normal. With the cowlings off, I checked the fluids, Saw that nothing was loose, I fueled up and checked the tow rope, all the usual things. Looking back, perhaps my checks weren't quite as thorough as usual. I'd flown the day before and I'd also completed the aircraft's 50 hour service. But I was happy, I was looking forward to flying, conditions were good and I felt fine and well rested. Our aircraft has a commercial off the shelf active carbon monoxide detector in the oddments packet in the panel. It's a sealed unit with a battery life of 10 years, and I tested it before it was put in the aircraft. The glider pilots were coming out in reasonable numbers after I conducted my pre-flight checks. It wasn't amazingly soarable, so it was likely I'd be towing on and off all day. Some training was going on too, so some of those flights would be shorter and more launches needed. Nothing unusual about that. I was happy, because I like flying. The little grid had built at the launch and the rope was attached and the release checked. I was ready to start launching. I started the aircraft without any trouble. As it was a cold day, I had the cabin heater on with all the vents closed. With the temperature nearing ready, I taxied up to the launch point. I completed my final checks once the glider was hooked up. The usual calls to take up slack were made and soon it was all out, meaning we were ready to take off. Initial acceleration was normal and the aircraft was performing as expected. For the first tour of the day, I'm always at a heightened state of alert. The glider pilot behind me was someone I trusted, but my fingers were locked around the release as ever. T's and P's appeared fine and the climb rate acceptable. The glider on the back was in the right position and I could see them in the mirror. At around 500 feet, the cabin jarred to the piercing sound of the active carbon monoxide detector going off. It was loud, even with my headset on. I turned the heater off as my first action, and then pushed the little vents open in the windows. I still needed to keep focused on flying, as I have a glider relying on me. I made a gentle turn back towards the airfield, called the tower on the radio, and told them what I was doing. I got into a good position, and waved the glider off by waggling my wings. They dutifully released, and I was able to go to idle power and head for the ground before they would need to land. Thankfully. The carbon monoxide detector wasn't sounding anymore, and I made an uneventful landing. The glider came in shortly after. I was shaken up and had a bit of a headache, but thought it was probably more psychological than physical. I was relieved to be back on the ground. The alarm had potentially prevented me from spending a day being exposed to lethal doses of carbon monoxide. Who knows how I might have become impaired by it. Just getting a gulp of fresh air does not get the carbon monoxide out of your bloodstream. Low level exposure over the day can make you very unwell. The active carbon monoxide alarm certainly surprised me. It's worth knowing what it sounds like so you know what's happening and how to silence it if you need to. The alarm sound can be heard through your headset, which is comforting. Remember, aviate, navigate and communicate in that order. If I'd had released the glider or lost control because the alarm surprised me, then it could have been a very different outcome. After a further inspection, it turned out the aircraft's exhaust had developed a crack, 
under the heater shroud. If exhaust gases leak, this can result in carbon monoxide in the cockpit. It is odourless and tasteless and produces headaches, drowsiness or dizziness. High concentrations can cause unconsciousness and death. This was not inspected as part of the 50-hour check. It has since been added to the routine checklist. Our active carbon monoxide detector is tested too and pilots briefed on how to use it and how it sounds. I definitely recommend flying with an active carbon monoxide detector. They're cheap, easy to use and could save your life. It is something we have in our homes as standard practice, so worthwhile and an essential investment. Just make sure you know what to do when it goes off and that it isn't a loose article in the cockpit. Oh, and don't neglect a check of your cabin heater either. Ensuring thorough checks are made when the aircraft is in for maintenance and carrying an active carbon monoxide detector will help mitigate the risks of carbon monoxide poisoning. Your life and those of others could depend on it. As some of you may be aware, we are actively exploring the use of carbon monoxide detectors in the GA community. We have launched a survey where we're basically asking you how often you use your active detector, does it ever cause distraction, um, and any other observations that you think would be helpful for us in setting our own policy around carbon monoxide. We have just released the first quarter of those results, and I want to thank all of you that have taken part in that. Please do continue to be part of it and to give us that feedback because it helps us understand how these detectors really work with you in the community and we can set the right policy. This brings us to the end of the Virtual Voyage GA Summit. We hope you found that content useful. As I've said throughout this presentation, please do feedback to us. It helps us improve these going forward. And any comments or questions, if you send them to virtual.voyage at ca.co.uk, and we'll be releasing a feedback survey. And if you could fill that in, that would be helpful. Thank you very much.